Well, Space Week is organized, um, uh, it is organized by UN General Assembly to appreciate human uh, contribution to space and space applications, how it has helped us to uh, develop technologies in space. So we are here from Art of Inquiry a Forum to teach astrobiology and space sciences to kids from preteen age. And it is, co it is founded and led by Dr. Julia Brodsky, who is also uh, the lead instructor of Art of Inquiry. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the World Space Week celebration. So I am Elan. Uh, we welcome you on behalf of Art of Inquiry, Dr. Julia Brodsky, and all the instructors. So before going into today's session, we have wonderful guests for uh, today's session. So I welcome Dr. Siddharth Pandey. Thank you so much, Elan, and my uh my welcome and warm greetings to the students who have joined, the others who will be listening to the session later on. And we are in an exciting new space age right now. And there's so much that is happening uh, as you're all uh, you know, in school right now. Some of you must be in university. Some of you might be having kids who are in school. So there's so much that you can get involved in. So what I thought I can talk about today was a little bit about the research that we do, which is actually about finding Mars on Earth. So there are several aspects of our own planet which help us understand Mars and they actually look a lot like Mars. Uh, maybe Mars that is today or Mars that is that was there many years ago, many, many years ago. So how is it that we can find Mars here on Earth? So just a bit about that. So let me just get started here. Okay. Right, finding mass on Earth. So this image actually that you see behind the text is from a place here in India called Ladakh. Ladakh is a very high altitude environment, almost 3,500 meters to 4,000 4, uh, 4, meters, which is almost four kilometers or in miles, that'd be about two miles above the normal surface of the sea. Right, so it's very, very high up in the mountains in the Himalayas, and uh, we find several different uh, things in this place that help us understand what Mars might have been like. So it's it's actually a uh, it's a very special place for some of us who try to study Mars as a planet. So I'm Sid. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer, and like many of you, I also started with the dream of going to space. Uh, some of you might want to become astronauts. Some of you might want to build rockets. Some of you might want to, uh, you know, design Mars rovers and, uh, and also perhaps even work at NASA or one of the other exciting space agencies, you know, in your own countries. Um, so I've been very, very uh, lucky and fortunate to be able to do a bit of all of those things in my career. And I think it's one of the coolest jobs to have. And I'm very, very fortunate that I've, uh, I've got this job that, you know, you do something that you really, really love. And uh, I've loved it since I was 14 years old and uh, I'm 31 years old now. So 32 years old now. So it's, it's still something that is, uh, you know, going on. It's still a permanent love. It hasn't ended. So very few people actually around me can say that. So if you're interested in space and if you want to make a career out of it, you should keep working at it. And I can assure you that you will have a very, very happy time as you're studying it, as well as eventually, you know, working at it. Um, so I actually got a chance to work at different, in different countries, in different roles, and I'm still learning. I'm still very much, I'd say, like a student learning as much as possible. Um, so it's, there are several aspects uh, that really excited me about space. Uh, but one aspect that really, really excited me about space was actually uh, Mars. But just before I get into that, I just thought I'll talk about what got me interested into, into space. And this is when I was, I think, somewhat your age. A uh, few of you must be, I'm guessing, between 11 and 14 years old. So when I was 14 years old, I was really, really inspired by an astronaut, and her name is Kalpana Chavla. Um, some of you might have heard her name. Uh, for the others, she was a NASA astronaut who was originally from India, and she had moved to the United States. And um, unfortunately, in a tragic accident, uh, she, along with her other six crewmates, 
um, lost her life when they were coming back from space to Earth in the space shuttle Columbia. So in February of 2003, we had these seven heroes who inspired so many people through their work, their life, and their mission. And at that point of time and that age, uh, that is the furthest I can recollect is when I really, really started thinking about making a career in space. And um, this might be a moment for many of you who might be watching other astronauts and scientists and space engineers. And maybe, you know, 20 years from now, you might be looking back at yourselves and thinking about 2021, which might have, in fact, you know, uh, inspired you. So keep, keep pushing at it. So it was initially for me a push to become an astronaut. But beyond that, as I thought more and more about it, you know, where did I really want to go in space? Which are the interesting worlds that I would like to visit? And we are here on our planet Earth. And when you go out into space, you can actually go to different worlds. And the nearest planets to us are both Venus and Mars, as you can see on the slide uh, next to Earth. And Venus is, as you can see, it is roughly about the same size as Earth and also has the same kind of weight as a planet. It has the same mass as Earth. Uh, but Mars, on the other hand, as you can see, it's, it's smaller. It's about one third the size of, of Earth. Um, they're obviously not as close as this image is trying to show. But the reason I put them there was to show you that um, these three planets have some similarities and several dis dissimilarities, the differences between them. But one thing is uh, that has been studied and uh, discovered is that the three planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars, was actually formulated at the same time, around the same time. But today, we find them to be so different. Right. So what was it that caused these planets to start in a very similar manner around the same time, but today became very, very different. So that is something that is really, really intriguing for us to understand that what brought about this difference. Right. And that's why we look at this hot, dense, cloudy Venus as a planet, which is having so much of carbon dioxide in it. And on the other side, you have Mars, which is this colder, drier planet. Right. Uh, which doesn't have much of an atmosphere, very, very thin kind of an atmosphere. And then you have Earth in the center, which is where we live. And for our existence, it is perfect. So in the next few years, what is Earth going to look like? Is it going to look like Venus? Or is it actually going to look like Mars? And that's a question a lot of scientists are trying to understand. So by studying these planets, we actually can help understand the future of our own planet. And that's a very, very important point for all of you to realize that when we study these other planets, it's actually helping us understand our own planet. And our planet is one planet out of other planets in our solar system. It's very much part of it. So space is not just somewhere further away, far away, disconnected from us. We are very much part of that space. And there is so much that is in common between our planets that we only are coming to realize. So I also work and I discovered myself in my interests of going into space was actually trying to find life in space. You know, many of you might have seen several different kinds of movies which talk about different kinds of aliens, right? So in this massive universe in which we live, is it so that we are alone? But, or is it so that there are many other planets that exist where life is existing? And what kind of life is there out there? So to start with, we, start, we try and understand how exactly does life on our own planet grow? And to do that, we go to different kind of environments. We go to environments which are very extreme. And when I say extreme, by that I mean very hot environments, very cold environments, environments that have a lot of salt, because salt is something that actually is uh, uh, is actually a substance that prevents a lot of life you know from actually growing you might have seen uh, or if you've had a lot of uh, pickles at home right uh, people add a lot of salt in pickles and that is mainly because salt pulls out all the water it dehydrates you know the food substance that you're uh, planning to preserve for long durations of time so salt does that it actually kills life but we find 
that if you go to some environments on our planet which are very salty we find that life is actually evolving and adapting to live in very salty environments and on mars we also have different kinds of salty environments so what kind of life are we expecting to find in uh, in such kind of salty environments so our universe or rather our solar system to start with is full of many of these kind of extreme environments and if you have to look for life in these extreme environments you have to first understand that what would that life look like how would it adapt how would it have adapted over millions and millions of years to be able to sustain itself and to be present there so many years back uh, this is when i was a master student this was my first project uh, which concerned mars and this was a project that i took up when i was uh, an intern at uh, uh, nasa's ames research center in california and at this particular center we were basically studying how can we bring back samples from mars and the reason we want to do that is because mars is a planet which is quite far away and to be able to set up a lab and take astronauts there it will take up a lot of space it will be a very expensive project so we will eventually do that that is of course the plan but before we actually do that it actually makes sense to collect the samples and to bring them back to earth to analyze so with those samples we will be able to understand how exactly did mars form what kind of a climate it might have had and what Uh, did it ever have life in the past or not so those are the kind of questions which require scientists to analyze to look at these samples under microscopes to do several different kinds of chemical experiments and to be able to determine whether these um samples can tell us more about answering this question whether life existed on mars or not so this was a project that i was uh, personally part uh, you know this was my first project that i took up and through that particular project I actually got very inspired to devote myself into Mars exploration and Mars studies. So what are the other benefits of exploring space? So there are several international space agencies like there is NASA in India we have the Indian Space Research Organisation or ISRO the Canadian Space Agency uh, the Australian Space Agency the European Space Agency so there are so many organizations around the world and all of these organizations actually are working together and coordinating their efforts together to explore space and why is it that they are doing that what is the motivation for them to do that well it's not just that we go to space to look for aliens we do that of course but in addition to that a lot of the technologies that we are developing for humans to be able to live on the moon or eventually go to mars a lot of that technology is going to help us here on earth because several of the systems that we develop to support life or other humans to live in space those technologies that are being developed or innovated are actually very very useful for humans who are living on our own planet for us living on this planet in very very extreme environments like in deserts in very very cold dry conditions or people who are even living in very very remote environments who don't have communications uh who don't have uh water access to water so how do you manage uh water in environments which do not have many uh, access to a lot of you know fresh water for consumption or for you know daily purposes so there are all these different things you also develop systems when you're look trying to develop different special cameras to look at other planets a lot of those cameras are currently being now utilized for monitoring our own crops on our planet and doing weather disaster monitoring of course it helps in terms of science right because that is the long term objective to be able to determine where did this universe start with you know right and how did the solar system start how did the planets come into be and what is the course of the future how is it all going to look like right and it's obviously very inspiring so many of you who are inspired to listen to uh, space engineers and scientists and astronauts it will inspire you all to take this further become scientists and then because it's an ongoing project right it will go on for many years and it will require more and many of you to join aerospace and space exploration right and it also helps in cooperation between different countries so overall it's a very very uh, good uh, you can say uh, you know endeavor on in uh, on the part of all the countries to kind of work together so space exploration has 
not just benefits for space, but actually has benefits for us here on Earth. So whenever somebody asks you this question that why should we put money to build a rocket to go to Mars or Moon, then these are the kind of points that you can talk about and explain to them the importance of the technology that is being developed or the innovation that is coming about and how it can actually help us here on our planet itself. So when we are, when we are training, when we are training to explore space, we need to go to different environments where we can test our instruments and our technologies. So all the different space agencies that are involved in space exploration, they use different sites on our planet to simulate a scientific and technical environment in which they can test the activities for eventually preparing themselves before they go to moon and eventually to Mars, right? And these sites are referred to as analog sites. So the word analog basically means that it is something that is similar to or analogous to. You might have heard this word. So analog environments or Mars analog environments are classified in terms of their how they physically do they actually look like Mars? Are there any uh, chemical similarities between the soil that we are finding here? Any geological similarity, right? And it could be similar to what we see on Mars today, or it could be similar to what we have on Mars that we might have had on Mars many millions and millions of years ago. So these images that you're seeing right now on this slide are actual images of astronauts or scientists and engineers who are actually training in this analog environment. So these range from places in Utah, in the, in, uh, in, in, in the United States, and also in Hawaii, there's actually a simulation camp there called High Seas. There are sites in Africa, in Europe, in India, and several of these sites are actually out in the natural environment, but you also have different artificially created sites where people actually test their rovers or different kinds of systems that need to be developed for Mars or Moon exploration. And if you had to talk about the specific technologies that are tested at these analogs, so here is a list for you to try and understand the importance of these analog sites. So communication systems, right? If you want to talk to an astronaut who is going to Mars, you have to be able to have a system that allows you to talk over long durations, right? So Mars is so far away from our planet Earth that it takes up to 20 minutes. So if you said hello to me right now, and if I was on Mars right now, it would take me 20 minutes to receive your message of hello. And then it would take me another 20 minutes to send a message replying back saying hello to you. So it will take 40 minutes only to speak a single sentence or you know get something across a conversation between person who's on earth and person who's on mars so we develop different kinds of systems that can simulate that 20 minute delay and that actually allows the different scientists to be able to train in those kind of circumstances where they are not expecting to have a live interaction or a immediate interaction you know between uh, the ground control on earth and their spacecraft, which is headed to Mars or on Mars. And because of this distance, it takes a lot of energy to be able to send this signal, this radio signal uh, over that entire duration. So you need a lot of different kinds of systems that can transmit and receive the signals uh, uh, over that kind of a distance. So that is as far as communications is concerned. Then when we talk about spacesuits, the kind of environment on Mars and Moon is very different from the environment here on our planet, right? First and foremost, on Earth, we are living in an atmosphere. It has carbon dioxide, it has oxygen, it has all these other gases, which exists at one atmosphere or one bar, right? So there is a pressure, atmospheric pressure that is maintained. All the gas that we have around our planet is actually being held together by Earth's gravity, is holding it together. So the gas is exerting a pressure on itself. And because of that, you have this atmospheric pressure. On the moon, there's almost no gas, near to no, nothing. So it's almost like a vacuum. 
just like space when you go into space it's a very similar environment when you're standing on the surface of the moon there's no atmospheric pressure on mars there is a small amount of pressure right and it is not oxygen it's mainly carbon dioxide so when humans travel to these places they actually need special suits which have oxygen supplies and also temperature is a very big factor when you're going to moon or when you're eventually going to mars the temperature is going to be very very cold and on the moon if you're there in the act if you're exposed to sunlight it can become very very hot so the space suit also ensures that the astronaut inside is having a, a very comfortable temperature environment right somewhere between 15 uh, degrees celsius if you're fluent in the uh, the you know the temperature degree uh, conversion um, or up to about 30 degrees celsius or 25 to 30 degrees celsius so it maintains a very room temperature the kind of temperature you'll have in your own room right now or your in your own classroom wherever you're located currently um, so that kind of an environment is normally maintained so but these suits are very very bulky they're very heavy suits that are developed for astronauts and you actually need to go and test it in the field in the actual environment that might exist uh, you know on uh, on mars and and to do that we go to places where you have the similar kind of rocks and powdery dusty uh, you know environment because that actually allows you to test how this suit is going to perform when it eventually is taken to mars right and when you wear this bulky suit it becomes very very difficult to carry out the different tasks if you're trying to explore a different place collect some samples take some measurements it's a very very uh, you know uh, difficult thing to do so to be able to test how efficient you are in the field you actually need to wear these suits and go into this kind of a analog environment or mars like environment and then do these kind of tests and in addition to that there are several other kinds of systems right so you have uh, environment stations uh, that you want to test. So all the different instruments that are developed to test there, whether it is a rover or if it is a climate monitoring system or it is a data storage system. So the kind of hard disks you have at home or you know your batteries, the different batteries that are there, all of those systems need to be tested. So the best place to test it is actually do it in the field as compared to doing it in the lab because that is your natural environment in which you can do this kind of test. So now coming to India, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the work that we are doing currently in India, uh, in addition to all the work that is happening across the world in the different um, Mars-like environments or Mars analogs, as I mentioned, um, I'll talk about the work that is currently happening right now in India. So what you see on your um, slide right now is a map of one Mars-like environment in Ladakh, the place that I mentioned at the start of my talk. So Ladakh, as you can see on the top right, there's, a, there's the, the northern part of India. The map of India is shown there. And Ladakh is that region marked in red. So it's quite high up. It's quite north. And it is inside the Himalayan range, right? So the Himalayas are the highest mountain range in the world. You might have you know, studied that in your geography. And it's, it gets very, very cold there, very dry there. And it's, it's a completely barren desert environment. But in some places, you actually do have some green patches that exist. You have certain lakes that exist and different kinds of streams, uh, water streams that exist. So you might say to me that on Mars, you don't really have any green patches or any rivers or lakes. So how is it similar to Mars? So the answer to that question is that Ladakh is actually similar to ancient Mars. So not the Mars that you're seeing today, but once upon a time, Mars was actually having a warmer climate. It was also having a lot of water on its surface. The atmospheric pressure was also very, very different. So the Ladakh of today is similar to the Mars of yesterday, Mars of the past, right? So that is the connection that we draw. And the different sites that you're seeing listed here, which is the zoomed in version of, of um, you know, the site that you're seeing here, you can see that blue, uh, this blue, oddly shaped place here right and this is the lake this is a this is a glacial lake so glaciers are basically slow moving ice over a period of time right and when they enter a small valley area they actually deposit all of that 
melted ice and it actually deposits and settles down as water right so all of this blue patch that you're seeing here is actually water that has come from glaciers that have normally flown down this path that you see here is actually a glacial path so all the glacier has flown down from the mountain peaks that exist over here if you can see my uh, uh, cursor my pointer and long time ago and then now what you're seeing here is the deposited water right so and all around this water you can see this white deposits here as well and that is all salt so how did salt get here so salt is something that was there on the top of these mountains right so salt is basically something like a mineral right it is stored it is mixed inside the the rocks and the different soil that exists and then because of all of this ice that has flown down from the top of the mountain uh somewhere over here and then flowed down and collected at the bottom of this valley here this glacial valley that you're seeing here um, and eventually what happens is that that ice melts it forms water and then the water evaporates and what is left behind is this salt which was initially mixed inside the water and then the water has eventually evaporated and only the salt is present here and as you can see from this picture here it's quite dry this portion at least right and that's mainly because it does not get a lot of rainfall so there's very little amount of rainfall that happens there and because of that it kind of has preserved many of the uh, different rock features that we see here and something similar to what we have on mars as well because even on mars there is no rainfall so just ignore all the different technical terms that are written here things like permafrost and uh, the different stations so we are actually planning to build a station close to the site as well and uh, conduct our work so in this small area we are actually able to see different kinds of features which will help us to explore mars we are actually seeing salt deposits we are seeing ice that is buried under the ground and there's actually also a hot spring site so a hot spring site is actually a place from where hot water underneath the surface is actually coming out right and and this actually shows that underneath the ground there is actually a large magma chamber there's a lot of lava that is stored there many kilometers underneath right and that is actually heating up the soil it is heating up the water that is stored inside and that water is eventually finding itself up way up and then coming out and that's what forms a hot spring so all of these different kinds of sites in this small area are very very interesting for us to understand uh, mars as well because when we are trying to look for life on mars we actually want to study these kind of extreme environments remember as i was saying we are interested in places that are really cold really hot really salty so this is the kind of place we'd like to visit where we get to see all of these kind of different environments so ladakh is a high value analog site the reason why it's high value is what i just mentioned on the previous slide that it has all of these exciting environments uh, for scientists to be able to actually look for um, uh, what kind of microbial life is actually living there and to be able to understand whether this same kind of life could have actually existed on mars as well or not so ladakh is like ancient mars uh, so ancient mars meaning billions of years ago 2 billion years ago um, many 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 you know so many uh, generations back you know even our own on our own planet we did not have 2 uh, billion years ago humans like us walking around we had only microbial organisms like bacteria and different kinds of smaller organisms living on our planet so those many years back even on mars just like on earth it had a very similar kind of an environment so the ladakh that we see today is similar to that ancient mars of many many years ago and because it is so so high up in terms of its altitude um, it has a very unique surface it has unique weather and unique microorganisms and why are they unique it's because they are exposed to this high altitude and because we are so high altitude the atmosphere is also very very thin right the pressure atmospheric pressure is almost uh, 50% of what you might be having right now so the oxygen is very very low and because it is so high up and the atmospheric uh, there's very little amount of atmospheric layer there the amount of radiation coming from sun is also very very high so the sun emits a lot of light as you know we see a lot of light that is coming to us if you go out to the beach 
uh, on a sunny day, you'll, you'll feel the warmth of light coming from the sun. And that's because the sun has a lot of energy as it is coming towards us. Well, some of that energy is actually uh, not good for us as well. And that is the ultraviolet part of that energy, right? So the UV radiation is actually harmful and it kills a lot of organisms as well. But we find in Ladakh and similar places that the life has actually adapted to live in that high ultraviolet radiation environment as well, right? So it has all of these unique environmental conditions that help us understand Mars. So since 2016, so about five years back, we have been conducting several trips to Ladakh and uh, those trips have been done in partnership with uh, you know, scientists from NASA, from the European Space Agency, several from India, Australia, and all of these people have been working together and we had conducted the NASA Space Outbound Program in 2016 to do this. And now we want to, we want to establish a research station there, which will actually allow students like yourselves um, you know, eventually once you become researchers and, and even university students to actually live there and test out the different technologies uh, for Mars exploration. So here are just some images of, uh, of Ladakh and I'll just show some more images and, uh, you know, we'll uh, wrap up the discussion for now. Um, so we are looking at all of these different features. So you can see on this slide, there are different images. So we'll work from the top. On the top left, you have a lot of sand uh, and different dunes, you might have seen sand dunes, you know, in geography, you might have studied about how wind actually uh, shapes different kinds of features in sand as well. And you have these little hummocks or little mounds that, that form as well. So, and we see this on Mars as well. And we have similar kind of things uh, in Ladakh. And between these different mounds, you have this water that gets collected uh, in, in the summer season every year. Right, and we are interested to see what kind of organisms are living in the inside this. In the center, you can see a lot of scientists sitting, haunching, and huddling around. All of this green stuff that is kind of flowing, and you see a little bit of smoke as well. Uh, you know, in, in the in the back of that image, and that smoke is basically all the steam that is coming out. And this is a hot spring site, so you have hot spring that is water, hot water coming from under the ground. And as it is coming out, it is boiling, right? So you have boiling hot water that is coming out. And eventually that hot water is creating conditions for life to live. And we have uh, water that is 70, 80 degrees uh, Celsius. And in this high temperature, we find these bacteria and different kinds of microorganisms that are living there. And all of that yellowish, greenish stuff that you see are these organisms, whether that could be algae or they could be bacteria or archaea. So there are all these different kinds of organi organisms that we find there living in these extreme conditions. And on the bottom behind the text, uh, it is a salt plat. It is that same lake that I'd shown you on that image uh, in the last slide, in that map. And the, all of that white stuff is actually salt. So the water has dried up and what is remaining is the salt behind, right? And uh, you also see some scientists above that image collecting these different kinds of rock samples to eventually take it back into lab, right? And above that, on the top right, uh, we have Ken Selburn from Sydney, who is uh, from Mars Society of Australia. Uh, and we were interacting with several of the students uh, who were, uh, you know, from that region, from Ladakh, and they were testing out different kinds of, we were playing different kinds of exercising, exercises of games, uh, building small kinds of rockets and having some fun with them. Right. So maybe there might be an opportunity for students to actually come to Ladakh and uh, train with us next uh, next year. We hope to be back there again and then do similar kind of work. Another very exciting thing that we did, we were just there two months back. Um, we actually took out a rover with us. And I just have a small video um, of a student of mine testing out a rover. So this was a rover that was built by students, engineering students, aerospace, uh, mechanical, electrical engineering students. And as you can see, it has six wheels, three on each side. And uh, this rover is meant to test different systems that will eventually be built 
for a rover that will be flying to Mars. So we test out the different kinds of wheels, the different kinds of suspension systems. We have different instruments on it, cameras, environment sensors, and all of these different systems are tested in a Mars-like environment. So this is actually being tested at 4,500 meters above sea level. And uh, the different kinds of environmental conditions that exist there, uh, the fact that it is in a dry desert environment. So this test that you're seeing was actually done over three different kinds of rock types that exist there at the edge of a dried up lake bed. So to, if you had to simulate something like this in your own lab, you need a lot of large space and you'd have to bring in a lot of tons of different kinds of rocks and set it up. Whereas you just can take it to a natural environment and then test it out there because those environments exist, right? So the name of this rover is Mascot. Um, hope we hope to have a page about this rover soon as well. Um, and it stands for Mars Amity Surface Characterization and Operations Trainer. It's a big, big word, but you can call it Mascot, right? And eventually we plan to take this rover to different parts of the world, hopefully, but right now maybe in India, as many places as we can and test it out in, in different kinds of conditions as well. There are other experiments that were also conducted. So we went to this dried up lake bed, like I showed you in the previous slide, and we were interested in what was underneath because even on Mars, we might not find life on the surface of Mars, but what is interesting is actually the underground environment of Mars. So we are really, really interested to see uh, what is underneath, you know, a few kilometers under the surface of Mars. And to do that, we test out different kinds of instruments uh, in, in environments on our planet, just like Ladakh, and to see what kind of environment exists underneath as well. Um, so, like I mentioned, two months back, we were there in Ladakh and um, we had several students with us uh, who had helped us carry out different experiments there. Um, they also included collected samples, water samples, ice samples, and then looking at them underneath a microscope, trying to identify any new kinds of organisms that might have not been found before. And sometimes collecting those samples, storing them, and then bringing them back to their universities or institutions, and then carrying out different kinds of you know, uh, processes on them to be able to understand uh, the different kinds of unique environments in, this, in which these organisms live, right? So these are the kind of experiments that are conducted. And this is an example of one particular place. And there are other similar places as well. Um, on our campus, so I'm currently in India, in Mumbai, and uh, we also have had workshops wherein we have actually brought in students, uh, explained to them the different concepts. And on the top right that you see here, we've actually also created a virtual reality environment uh, for in which uh, rather than going to these places, you can actually first wear this virtual reality headset and then look around you. And then we have developed an entire environment, a Mars-like environment in which you can actually conduct your initial experiments in it and then train yourself before you actually go to this Mars-like environment, uh, you know, an actual Mars environment as well. So now coming to another site, um, and I'll quickly go through this. So in central India, in the middle of India, we have something known as a crater. So some of you might be knowing what a crater is, um, but for the others, a crater is this massive hole or a cavity that actually forms on earth. Whenever there is a, like you might've heard of shooting stars or meteorites as they enter the earth's atmosphere, these fiery balls, and then they come with such a high speed and then they impact at a very, very high velocity onto the surface. And because they're coming at such a high velocity and such a high amount of speed, they ram into the surface and they create this massive cavity, which is called a crater, right? And we find a lot of these craters on the moon and on Mars. And to study them, we actually study the craters here on Earth as well. So the current mission that NASA has sent, the latest one to Mars, has actually landed inside a crater site, which is very, very similar to a crater here in India called Lona Crater. And this crater is currently being explored and hopefully soon we will have different you know, expeditions there as well. So you can actually learn a lot from these kind of surface features that exist. And this is just to show you the different sites in Ladakh again. I just had put together some more pictures. So I won't go into too much detail for you, but just to kind of give you a glimpse of what are the different kinds of environments that exist in, in, that, in that place. 
So you have this dry desert environment, you have these lakes, you have the hot springs, you have these ice deposits, you have glaciers. So these all these different environments, which are salty, some of them are hot, most of them are very, very cold, almost all of them are dry. So these are the kind of environments we are interested in because that is what is there currently on Mars or was there on Mars many, many years back. So similar to Ladakh and the crater site that I mentioned, there are some other sites that we hope to explore in the next few years. And it might be that some of you who move on and then get into your university and college systems might actually help us explore them. So there's of course, Lonar Crater that I spoke about. There's another environment in India, in the west of India called Kutch, right? And Kutch is a salt flat. So some of you might be familiar with these salt flat regions. So many, many years ago, this entire area was actually underneath an ocean. And now that the ocean has dried up or has moved away, it has left behind this massive flat bed of salt. And we have similar kind of salt beds on Mars as well. And this image that you see in the center here is actually a red pond. It's a pinkish red pond that exists in the middle of the salt flat. And you might have seen some images of this gorgeous pink color lakes that are there in Australia, in Africa. And the reason why they get colored is because of a certain kind of an organism, a microorganism that grows inside it, a certain kind of a bacteria that grows inside it that gives it that color. So we are interested in understanding, and, and that's mainly because it's so, so salty and they are able to live in this very salty environment. Um, the other sites are in Antarctica. So as you would be knowing, which is the seventh planet, uh, the seventh continent, uh, one of the coldest places on our planet. Um, even in such places, you have environments that are similar to Mars. You have caves, and in India, we have caves in Meghalaya, Chhattisgarh, and there are other cave systems across the planet in other places as well. So we are interested in caves because there might be similar caves on Mars where life might have existed in the past. We are interested in volcanoes because Mars also had volcanoes in the past. And we, we want to see in this hot, very acidic environment, what kind of life lives. So India actually has an active volcano site on Barren Island in the uh, Andaman Sea. And even underneath the water, we are interested to find places where you have this hot gases that are coming out, right? So not so much for Mars, but some other places in our solar system, which is probably a topic for another day, you have these environments where hot gases are coming out and eventually heating up the water around it. And we find a lot of bacteria that lives there. So in the Indian Ocean, if you go down four to five kilometers, you'll find these hot smokers or hydrothermal vents, as they're called, which is mainly a lot of hot gases that are bringing up a lot of nutrients from underneath the ocean floor. And around them, you have colonies of not just bacteria, but also things like crabs and different kinds of fishes that are living there. So all of these are very, very unique environments in which life is living. So as space explorers, don't just think about the work in space, but actually think about exploring our own planet, which is actually going to be helping us find what kind of life might exist elsewhere. So to, to go to Mars, you have to first find Mars here on Earth and to be able to study that. So that's my last slide, and I will end with one of my favorite quotes from Kalpana Chawla, which is the path from dreams to reality does exist. May you have the vision to see it, courage to get on it, and the perseverance to get through it. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddharth. It was a wonderful presentation and our students have lots of questions. So I would like to go and uh, ask you the question from Ratnamla. She asks how the space suits are designed for astronauts so they can feel comfortable when they go on other planets too. So that's actually a great question. Um, space suits are actually designed for a particular activity. So you might have seen astronauts when they are about to enter the spaceship, they're wearing a very different space suit, right? Um, and when they are in space and they are outside the International Space Station, they're wearing a different suit. Um, you might have seen older pictures of astronauts walking on the surface of moon and they're also wearing a very, very different suit. And now uh, the suits that are being designed for people who will be one day going to Mars will be very different. So 
it depends what that particular environment is for which the suit is being built if it has to go to space uh, definitely it needs to have a lot of coating and a lot of padding inside it to ensure a lot of insulation and covering so that you are not getting uh, the temperature that you are in so if you might be in a very cold environment or a very hot environment so there are heaters or coolers inside the space suit which actually ensure that the right temperature is maintained um, sometimes the sunlight can be very very bright so you have visors or you know glass covers on your helmet that protect you as well and if you're actually going to the lunar surface or the moon surface or mars surface there's a lot of dust in the environment so the suit has to be very very dust proof because dust is uh, it can actually uh, create a lot of problems for the people because it actually gets inside the joints of the suit and that actually prevents uh, the suit can actually break down it can actually wear out as well right so there are a lot of different different suits that are built for the different environments that's really wonderful to hear we have another question from student quinn he asked um, does mars have anything like hot springs either on the surface or in the subsurface that could also allow life to form there so that's again a great question um so mars actually had in the past uh, hot springs it doesn't have them anymore but what we have found today are different kind of uh, materials that are normally found only around hot springs so we see a lot of water activity so whenever water flows uh, it flows in a certain way it changes the rocks or the surface features in a certain way um so we have found that uh, there are certain sites in columbia hills in fact uh, you should read about columbia hills on mars where they have actually found these hot spring sites so once upon a time when mars had water on its surface it definitely had hot springs thank you so much for answering the questions dr sid um right now we don't have any more questions from the students but i believe everyone enjoyed the session thoroughly like i enjoyed it so thank you so much for joining us today uh, dr siddharth it was a very wonderful presentation i take this opportunity to thank dr julia for organizing this webinar and also special thanks to dr siddharth for inspiring our students with this wonderful session thank you so much for joining us dr sid thank you so much elan and thank you julia for the opportunity as well Take care, students. If you want to reach out to us, you can always contact us at uh, artofinquiry.net. Uh, if you have any more questions, please keep coming uh, at the website of Art of Inquiry. We will definitely answer you in the mail. Thank you so much for joining today's session. Take care. You have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. It was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I got <laughs> lots of pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, guys.